Let us open our Bibles then to Proverbs chapter 15. I was going to try to devour the whole chapter, but it was nearly impossible. So we're going to go over four verses today. Proverbs 15. Use your words wisely is the title of today's teaching. And that is something that we can all grow in. Can I get an amen? I don't think anybody has a perfect handle over their tongue and their words, but it's something that we're always praying about and striving for. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ had a perfect handle over every word that came out of his mouth. And we are called to be like our Lord. Proverbs 15. Let us begin by reading verse 1. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up what? Anger. The word soft there could be gentle. So a gentle answer turns away wrath. Another word for wrath would be anger or rage or fury. But a harsh, that is a ruthless, cruel, tough word, stirs up anger. What is this passage saying? It's saying that we have the ability to either cool things down or heat things up with our words. First and foremost, we are called to be peacemakers. We are called to be peacemakers. We are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore we are empowered by his spirit and expected to be humble peacemakers, not unnecessary and avoidable war makers were peacemakers. And one way in which we keep the peace or try to bring about peace in a time of hot arguments and disagreements, it is to use our words wisely and to say things that'll cool things off. We are called to make tough, sticky, and argumentative situations better, not worse. We live in a world where people disagree. We live in a world where there is conflict. We live in a world where we annoy one another, right? And so there is always going to be verbal conflict, whether it's in the marriage, in the church, at work, wherever you go, even with strangers. But yet you and I are called to be peacemakers. You and I are called to make things better, not worse. And depending on how we use this tongue of ours, things do get better or they do get worse. Now, there have been many times in my life when I found myself in a situation where I could have done things better, said things right, and I didn't. But as you grow, you learn and you desire to fail less with this tongue that God has given us. And so, for example, the way in which we choose to reply, respond or react with our words and attitudes, we can either be like water that puts out the fire or we can be like gasoline that makes the fire bigger. Again, we are called to cool things down, not heat things up. When we find ourselves in a fiery argument, we shall ask ourselves some very simple questions. And by the way, we should ask ourselves these questions before we actually get into an argument. Why? Because we always got to be ready. We always got to be ready. You never know when things are going to get hot. You never know when people are going to get angry. You never know when you're going to be attacked verbally by someone you don't know or someone you do know and love. So you have to be ready to ask yourself these questions. Is my response going to make matters worse? Or is my response going to make matters better? Now you and I might be saying, that's super simple. Yeah, it is. But not always in practice. And because when you're in the moment, sometimes you don't really even think about the words that are coming out of your mouth. You don't really work with the words that are coming into your mind and you don't assort them in a way that honors God. You just, you just go by your emotions and your feelings and you just say what's on your mind, right? No matter how it comes out or how it hurts those you're talking to. We really do have to ask ourselves, is what I'm about to say and how I'm about to respond right now going to make matters better or are they going to make matters worse? Now, you and I both know whether things are going to get better or not. I think we have enough wisdom to know. Another question to ask yourself would be, would the Lord be pleased with my response? 
Would the Lord be pleased with my response? Do my words and actions and attitudes represent Christ well? Whatever argument you might find yourself in, you can ask yourself, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? So again, do we want to turn away or avoid anger and the potential fight? Or do we want to stir things up? Sad to say, some people just like to fight. Some people like to push buttons, all the right buttons, wrong buttons, if you know what I mean. Some people just like to fight. They feel alive. They, they get a kick out of it. They get a, a thrill out of it. But I tell you one thing, there's nothing good that comes out of it. Things only get worse. When you've got two prideful people acting like rams and button heads over and over again, you're going to destroy the relationship sooner or later. And so we have to ask ourselves these questions. Do we want the fight to stop or do we want to stir things up? It really is our choice. And our words are the water or the gasoline. If we really want peace, we're going to aim for it. We're going to aim for it. How do we aim for it? By the way we use our words. So we are to use our words wisely. Like, I don't want this thing to get out of hand right now. I know my wife's angry with me, but I don't want this thing to get worse. So I'm going to humble myself and think about certain things and then speak, right? Maybe take things to God in prayer before we speak. Or whatever situation you may find yourself in, don't be quick to just jump in. We really do have to use our words wisely, church. If there is one thing that the Lord has entrusted us with, believe it or not, it's our tongues. It is this thing that gets us into trouble more than many other things. It is what we say and how we say it that can cause some real damage, real damage. Let's read a positive Old Testament example of how a soft answer turns away wrath. Let us turn our Bibles then to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30, we're going to read verses 21 to 25. This is an Old Testament example of how a soft answer turns away wrath. Really quick to give you some background. In this chapter, the Amalekites invade King David and the camp. And they kidnap two of King David's wives. And then they steal all of their goods. Long story short, David seeks God for direction. He asks God if, um, if he pursues these enemies, if God would give them the victory, God gives them the green light. He says, go ahead, fight back, bring your stuff back, everything that they have taken. And that's exactly what King David did. He and 400 other men pursued the enemies and were able to overtake them he was able to get his wives back. The men got their children and their wives back and they got all the spoil back. And then let us read here in 1 Samuel 30, verse 21, 25, to see how King David responded to a handful of wicked men in his crew. Let us begin here in verse 21, 21 to 25. Now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they also had made to stay at the brook Besor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with them, him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men. I mean, if wicked's not bad enough, wicked and worthless, that's double trouble. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except, of course, for every man's wife and child, that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, listen to his response. But David said, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? In other words, what you're saying is really not making sense. You're not going to win the majority with this 
thought of yours. 24. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. So it was from that day forward, he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. So as you can see there, some of the men that went to recover this stuff felt like they were entitled to keep all the spoil for themselves. But King David said, no, 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 no. The men that stayed behind, they stayed behind because they were too tired to cross the brook. And he basically said, you guys went to war, we got the stuff, they stayed back and took care of the supplies. In other words, they're worthy of the spoil as well. And so this was their idea. They were thinking, oh, let's keep everything to ourselves. Those guys stayed behind. King David said, you know, no, you don't understand. We're all a team. You did your part. They did their part, right? And so I think these men, because they're wicked and worthless, they were actually angry with David. They wanted this to happen. They wanted to keep everything. Now, King David could have, could have given in to the argument. King David could have gotten angry with them. He could have called them wicked and worthless men in front of everybody and he could have told them, look, you're not going to get anything because of your bad attitude. But did he do that? No, he, he used wisdom, he used reason and he was able to reason with these wicked men because had he not done that, listen to me church, had he not done that, there would have been another bloody mess on his hand. He stopped an internal battle, that's what he did, with his words. Because things could have gotten out of hand right away. These men would say, okay, let's put our dukes up. Let's fight for this stuff. But David was smart enough and wise enough not to get heated and to say certain things that will move their hearts to think rationally and agree with King David. Why? Because he kept calm. He, he did exactly what the passage said. A soft answer turns away wrath. These men were angry. His soft answer turned away wrath. And it was a good thing he did that because I can guarantee you that these wicked men would be the ones who would die and not David. But you can see there that David used wisdom. I'm telling you, people are too quick. If we're in that circumstance, right away we want to fight about things, you know? We want to have it our way and we want to tell these people how dumb they are and that the idea they just had is stupid and, you know, but that's not what he did. Obviously, he didn't like it, but he used wisdom. He stayed calm. He stayed collected. And then he gave what he thought was the best way to do this. And they were like, okay, that's, that's pretty good. We'll, we'll go your way. And so again, we can choose to use wisdom. We can choose to use wisdom. David didn't react harshly. Because of that, things didn't go south. Now let's read a negative Old Testament example of how a harsh word stirs up anger. So we had the positive, how a soft answer turns away wrath. Now we're going to read a negative example of how a harsh word stirs up anger. And that is found in 1 Kings in chapter 12. Verses 1 to 20. But before we read here, King Rehoboam is Solomon's son. He's King David's grandson. And he has an opportunity here to win his people with a response that is kind towards them, that is loving towards them. As we're going to read, he got counsel from two groups of people and he chose the bad counsel. And so what happened was he lost 10 tribes just because of his harsh word towards the people. Judah and Benjamin followed Rehoboam and the rest followed Jeroboam. But let us read here verses 12. 1 to 20. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt. Then they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, your father made our yoke heavy. Your father is speaking of Solomon. Your father made our yoke heavy. He overtaxed them. He overworked them. He turned his people into slaves. And that's the reason or one of the reasons why he was so wealthy and powerful. 
Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. They weren't asking for much. They were just saying, just lighten up on us and, and we will serve you happily, basically. Five. So he said to them, depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. And he said, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them. Proverbs 15, 1, right? A soft answer turns away wrath. That's basically what they were counseling him to do. He says, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But what did he do? He rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him. So he went to those who were like-hearted and like-minded, who were just as foolish as he was, right? He went to the young guys who enjoyed some of Solomon's riches and wealth and power. And so they wanted to keep that. But it goes on to say here, who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, what advice do you give me? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you made it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. Those are some harsh words. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips. I will chasten you with scourges. In other words, I'm going to use greater force than my father Solomon on you people. Twelve. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had directed, saying, come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly, roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men saying my father made your yoke heavy but i will add to your yoke my father chastened you with whips but i will chasten you with scourges so the king did not listen to the people for the turn of events was from the lord now the lord was definitely at work but this was rehoboam's heart and rehoboam's words that he might fulfill his word which the lord had spoken by Ahijah, the Shilonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we with David? He says, We have no inheritance of the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue, but all Israel stoned him with stones and he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam mounted his chariot to haste to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel had been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over Israel. That's over the ten tribes. There was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. Wow. You see here that Rehoboam had an opportunity to listen to the advice of the elders and say something kind to the people like, yes, I'll lighten the load. No big deal. It was no big deal, church. But his pride didn't let him do it and God's will. And so what he did was he, he just made things worse. He made, it, he made it worse for the people. And so we can see here that his words divided the kingdom. His attitude, his words towards these people divided the kingdom 10 to two. 
So we can see here that the, that a harsh response, a bad attitude towards somebody has the power to divide. Not just a kingdom. That's a whole lot. But words have the power to divide churches and the power to divide families and marriages and relationships and even the best of friends. That's how powerful words are. Do you want to react and respond in a harsh way towards the person that is arguing with you? Instead of bringing connection and peace between you two, you're going to divide each other even more. You are. So it's better to be humble in our response, right? Why? Because a soft answer turns away wrath. We saw that with David. But what? A harsh word stirs up anger. And that's exactly what King Rehoboam did. So much anger that they said, all right, you're on your own. We're getting ourselves a new king. Peace. Have fun. And guess what? We're taking 10 tribes with us. That's what happened. You want to be harsh with us? We're out. And if you want to be harsh to the ones you love, God forbid one day they'll be out. Because that's what words do. Words chase people out of the house. Words chase people out of the business. Words chase people out of the church. Harsh words hurt people and they will leave. Do you hear me? And so we have to be very careful with the way we respond, react, and react towards those who are angry with us. Whether they're angry with us justly or unjustly, we are to be like Christ on our part. Amen? Be at peace with all men as much as you can possibly. All right? We don't want to learn this bad lesson like Rehoboam. I've heard of teenagers saying things to their parents in anger and frustration like, I hate living here. I think every teenager has said that at least once. I wish I had a better family. And instead of the parent using wisdom, for example, a soft answer like, why kiddo? What's wrong? How about we sit down and we talk about your situation and we can make some changes to make you feel better about the home and the family that God has given you, right? But quickly, what happens is parents who hear words like that get offended. And instead of responding in love with a soft answer, they choose to use harsh words like, okay, you don't like this family? Leave them. We don't want you here anyway. You're just taking up room and you're eating all my food. And what happens to the kid? The kid takes it to heart and all of a sudden he's overwhelmed with bitterness and anger and resentment. And next thing you know, a teenager runs away and never to be seen again. I mean, you'll hear, hear stories like this one after another. Why? Because people are just not willing to respond in a kind, loving way. Because it's harder to get to the root of things and show love and instruct. It's easier to blow up and say, all right then, have it your way. Get out! That's so much easier than to say, come, sit down, let's talk, let's pray, let's work this together. I know you're angry with me, I'm kind of angry with you too, but let's make this happen because we're family and because we serve God, right? But I'm telling you, people are way too quick, way too short-fused, and um, they have no control over the words, and they make a mess of things. Again, there is power in soft, understanding answers. There is power in soft, understanding answers. It turns away wrath. It turns away wrath. By the way, anytime teenagers or some people that you know and love complain about certain things. There's always underlying things that are really important to them and that are hurting them. You just got to get to the, to the root of the problem in love. And uh, you could really save a relationship there. And there is power in harsh words, right? Harsh words do what? They stir up anger. And some people, they don't know what to do with their anger. Some people don't know how to cope with anger. And you don't want to be the reason why people get more angry. Why? Because, I mean, some kids run away. Some people hurt themselves. Some people commit suicide. Some people begin to slander. And, I mean, anger out of control ends up doing a lot of damage 
to the person who's angry and possibly to the person whom they're angry with. And so it's, there's nothing good that comes out of it. Our job is to be peacemakers. I don't know how I'm going to fix this problem, Lord, but I do know that I have control over my words and I know they have power, so I'm going to, I'm going to try and say the right thing right now. Can you give me the wisdom? Holy Spirit, can you give me the grace to do that? Right? And he does. He really does. A few months back, I was put to the test. Some of you know this, some of you don't. But our next door neighbor here to my right accused the church of graffitiing on his north wall. I mean, I saw the graffiti and I thought, man, I can't even draw that good with a pencil. That's not us, right? He thought it was us. He was convinced and we were right here, right outside. And he was yelling in my face and he was cussing me out. And I was tempted to boil up with anger too, I'll be honest with you. But I just knew that, hey, I'm a representative of Christ right now. Like I thought that. And I just stayed calm and I stayed collected. And he kept cussing, cussing and yelling at me and telling me this and telling me that. I'm just standing there looking at him, listening to him. And when he was done, I just said, look, I respect how you feel. I really do. I said, you're a neighbor. We should be working together. We never wanted this to happen. And so I just told him, look, I respect how you feel, but we didn't do it. We didn't graffiti your wall. And I noticed that because I was staying calm and I wasn't giving him back the same junk. It was almost like, like nothing was getting in. Like he wasn't moving me to be as angry as he was. And so he almost felt like the bullets were ricocheting, if you will, you know, and I could see it in his eyes. Like he's like, and I'm just like, I'm not going to fight with you, bro. You know, but if I would have gave into the flesh, it would have turned into a fist fight. If any of you guys were out there listening and watching what was going on, you would think, wow, like I would have already swung twice. You know what I mean? It was that bad. But the Lord gave me the grace. And the reason why God gave me the grace is because I'm thinking ahead. Like, remember, you're a representative of Christ. What kind of picture are you going to show and display for others to see? And so it's going to come and it's going to test all of us in one way or another. Whether it's in the home, at work or somewhere else, someone's going to get in your face. Someone's going to get in your face like they did with King David and like they did with Jeroboam. How are you going to respond? A soft answer or a harsh word? There's consequences to the soft answer and they're more positive than negative. And there's consequences to harsh words, and they're more negative than positive, all negative. And so we have to be very careful in the way in which we respond. Amen. Let us read now the second verse. Proverbs 15 and verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Listen, both the wise and the foolish are exposed by the words they speak. It has been said, you know a fool by what he says, by how he speaks. The wise speaks knowledge and the fools speak nonsense. That's how you know who's who. You know where people are by the way they speak. The wise person thinks twice before speaking and when he or she speaks, whether it's counsel or advice, or just some friendly, fun conversation, sometimes the wise person will play back the words that were used and they will recall on whether or not they were honorable words, encouraging words, God-honoring words. Why? Because the wise person sees their tongue, listen to me, as a tool for good. They're just not just talking into the air. The wise person is very calculated about the way he or she speaks because they know that words do something. And so you, you have that in mind before you speak. Like I can, I can literally encourage somebody right now or I can tear that person down. Or you know what? I could just be so flippant with my words that I could just be offending the person who's making coffee 10 feet away from me. Not even talking to that person, but my stupid words are causing that person to be offended, right? And so we have to think about our surroundings. Now, none of us are perfect at this. We're going to offend in many things like the disciple James says, right? We offend in many things. And one way in which we offend is with our words. But we have to be very calculated and careful with the words that come out of this mouth of ours. 
because we could be building people up or we could be tearing them down. Somehow words are affecting someone in one way or another, negative or positive. Words are powerful. They go out and they do something. And so wise people see their words as tools. They use words like um, a construction worker uses his tools. You know, he's got his, his trowel, his line, tape measure, and his level. And he's using these, these tools to, to erect or to build a wall, right? And so the wise person is, in the, sa is the same way. I'm going to use this word and, and that word. And I'm going to talk like this and with this attitude and this tone of voice because I want to I build something up. I don't want to tear something down. So your words work like tools to build people up. What kind of tools do you got? What kind of tools do you got in that toolbox of yours? I hope they're tools that build up and not tear down. So they know that their tongues are as tools for good, for right words, spoken at the right time, spoken with the right attitude, the right way. Fools, on the other hand, seem to have no reserve, no filter, no cap, right? Everything just blurts out. Whatever comes to the mind first, just boom. Can't take it back, right? Kind of like a toothpaste. You squeeze that thing, the toothpaste comes out, and it's impossible to get that toothpaste back in. In the same way, a fool just blurts everything out and wishes he could put it all back in, but he can't, right? Can't take your words back. You can apologize, and you should, but you can't take your words back. They're out. Again, the foolish person just blurts out whatever comes to their mind first, whether it's in a conflict or some casual conversation. They're just, they're just talking. They're just talking. No filter, no reserve, no cap. On the other hand, the wise may trade what comes to mind second for what comes to mind first. The wise man thinks. He thinks twice, he thinks three times. And sometimes the first, the first thing shouldn't be said, so he kind of puts that to the back and he finds something better to say. And as I get older, I feel like I'm able to do that more and more, but when I was younger, I was that fool, man. Most of the time, just, whatever comes out first. And, and people remember. I mean, I've had people tell me, man, you were so mean. And your jokes were so sharp. And you were, you were so sarcastic. And I'm just like, thank God I'm not like that anymore. And you should hang around with me more often. See what Jesus can do, right? See what the Lord has done. I look back and I think, man, I was a pain in the butt. I really was. I was mean. I was sharp. I was... In my own mind, I was kind of witty, man. I could just chop anyone down at any time. But now I'm like, no way. I want to build people up. I want to say the right thing at the right time, in the right way. Why? Because I'm a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? I mean, if that's not the greatest motivation, I don't know what other motivation will motivate us more than that. We belong to Jesus. We belong to Jesus, and therefore we will speak in ways that honor our Savior. Fools automatically hurt and offend people because, again, the well-being of others is not one of their main concerns. Speaking stupidly is. By the way, fools can care less about honoring God and blessing people. That's not on the agenda. Verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. That verse is very powerful, folks. Let me read that again. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Well, they're here right now, aren't they? They're in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Sorry to burst some of your bubbles, but it's not Santa Claus who watches the good and the evil of all. It is God. This powerful verse speaks of the omniscience of the Lord. The Lord knows all and the Lord sees all. And by the way, he knows all and sees all now. He sees everything at once. You and I, we have limited vision. I can only see what's in front of me. God sees what's in front of him, what's behind him, what's under him, what's above him. I mean, God sees everything and everyone everywhere. The Bible even says that the dark is as light to him. No one hides from him. In fact, King David writes a 
Psalm 139 speaking of how he cannot get away from the presence of God. Nothing escapes the sight of God. His holy eyes see everything that goes on in this planet. That thought alone is interesting, isn't it? That there is nothing that God doesn't see. I mean, there are things that if we saw, we would go crazy. We would go crazy. And yet God sees it all. And he says here, he's keeping watch on the evil and the good. In other words, we have a God who sees everything and records everything. He keeps watch. In other words, he takes note of all the evil and all the good that happens in his sight. His all-seeing eyes. Wise persons truly understand and have a keen awareness of the Lord's all-seeing eyes in every place and at all times. And that's the reason why wise folk are careful with what they say, are careful with what they watch, are careful with what they do, because they know that the holy eyes of God are on them 24-7. No matter where you are, no matter how dark the room is, the Lord is watching His people, and we have this keen awareness, and they're the same eyes that look upon us with love and compassion, and they watch over us as a father watches over his children, at the same time, he's as a father who watches and makes sure that his children are not up to no good. Right? And so the Lord's eyes are upon us always. And the wise person knows it. To have a keen awareness. They cannot sin comfortably. Nor can they speak flippantly because they just know that the Lord sees all and hears all. Everything. All day. At the same time, the eyes of the Lord bring about comfort and confidence because no one has our best interest and has our backs like the Lord, right? Amen. Who sees all and knows all. So it's a comforting thing. It's a fearful thing that God sees and hears everything. Yeah, it is. But it's also a very comforting thing. Because if the God who sees and knows all is your father and he loves you like he loves his son, there are no better eyes that I want on me. There are no better eyes that I want on me. They make me fearful sometimes. But they bring me the greatest joy and the greatest confidence at times too. I love his eyes. And I want them on me. As long as they're on me, I know I'm safe. And his eyes on me are a sanctifying effect in my life. Whenever you have the fiery eyes of Christ on you, fire refines. And you're being refined the more you understand that his eyes are upon you to make you holy to make you honest, to make you a man and a woman of integrity in the secret chambers and places of your heart. We want these eyes on us, church. Second Chronicles 69, I'll read it to you, says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show himself mighty on behalf of them whose hearts is perfect toward him. So God is always looking to bless those who truly love Him and truly trust Him. So the fact that His eyes are on us is a good thing. Even though He keeps record, even though He takes note of all things, it says here that His eyes go to and fro, all the earth, looking for those who truly fear Him, truly love Him. That way He can show Himself mighty in your life. So you should be saying, Lord, I hope you're looking this way. Because I'm doing my best to trust in you. I'm doing my best to love you with all of my heart. Show yourself mighty here, Lord. Stop here. Give your neck some rest and stop here. And use your servant. It should be our desire. If he is looking to and fro, you should be doing this number. Right here, don't pass me. Don't pass me. Use me. Show yourself mighty in my life says, keeping watch on the evil and the good, the Lord takes notice of all, both good and evil. Again, He records it all. He repays. So He records and He repays both good and evil. The Lord sees all that happens in prisons, nightclubs, frat houses, casinos, schools, churches, in Planned Parenthoods, in drug houses, in bars, in courthouses, in the White House, in homes, in hearts, in minds. 
Whatever happens in Vegas stays on God's mind until judgment day, right? God sees everything, everywhere, at all times. I remember a time when my brother Abel and I were sitting in a tractor in Mexico. We were visiting our great grandmother who made the best beans ever, my dad's grandma. And I remember we were sitting in this tractor, me and my brother, he was about five, I was six, and uh, we were talking and, and I flipped him off. I just did, I got angry and I gave him the finger. He looks at me and he says, you know, God saw that, right? He told me that. And I was like, no, he didn't. I said, we have a roof over our head. The tractor had a roof. And he looks at me, he's all, seriously? God can see through the roof. That's what he tells me. And that was the first time I, I think I understood the omniscience of God. <laughs> and so when you're young and you're immature, you think that God is not watching. You think that God is not recording. And you live that way. That's when you know that you don't know that he is watching. It's when you just say, ah, no big deal. Oh, that's when I know that you don't know that he is watching. And so that was a really good lesson for me to learn at the age six from my brother Abel. Again, my first lesson on the omniscience of God. Verse four, and we'll close. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Hmm. This one commentator says about this verse. Good and wholesome words are like a tree that continually brings life from its shade and its fruit. Our words have the power to do far more good than we often think. If someone's tongue is perverse, that is twisted, Crooked, corrupt, instead of wholesome, their words will break the spirit of others. Our words have the power to do far more harm than we often think. Let us read Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 together. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that means building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. There's that fruit. There's that tree of life. Grace, impart, give like good fruit, grace to the hearer. Words that strengthen. Let's read verse 30 as well. So we know what grieves the Holy Spirit. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What grieves the Holy Spirit? When you don't have a lid on this thing. When you don't regulate the words that come out of your mouth. When you just blurt things out to hurt the person that's hearing you. You are grieving the Holy Spirit. You see, many people want to know about what the Holy Spirit can do. I'll tell you what you can do. You can hurt him with the way you speak to others. You can grieve the Holy Spirit in your life. By the way you use your words in an unwise, unloving you want to be mature? You want to be holy? You want to be effective? Control this tongue of yours. You see, everybody in the church today wants to be someone, wants to start a channel, wants to be in a band, want to open a church. They want to do all of these things. Well, let's start with first things first. How do you speak to other people? Starting with your wife, your kids, and the closest people around you. How do you treat them? Then we'll talk about what else you want to do for God. And then we find here in James chapter 3 and verse 2, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Here speaking of maturity, because no one's perfect on this side of heaven. Able to bridle, that is to control the whole body. So basically the individual who has 
A good hold on his words, a control on his words is able to control the rest of his body. May this be our aim in life, to watch our words, to use our words wisely to the glory of God. You want to be a mature Christian? You want the rest of your body to honor God? Start with this muscle in the mouth first, right? Glenna Ravenhill calls it the little red devil behind a line of white soldiers. <laughs> Sometimes that's what it is when it's not bridled, when it's not controlled. And so we learn here today that a soft answer turns away wrath and a harsh word stirs up anger. Church, give soft answers, gentle answers. Give gentle replies. I'm not saying that you have to be weak. I'm saying you have to be wise and you have to be Christ-like with your words, because we're here not to tear people down, but to build people up.